Welcome to EPG Partshala. I am Ravi Korisetter, Senior Fellow, Dr. V.S. Wakankar Archaeological Research Institute, Bhopal. The subject is Indian Culture. The paper is Pre and Proto History of India, and the module is Ceramic Technology. Ceramics have played a very important role in the archaeological reconstruction of the agricultural societies and their life ways. And pottery has played a very important role in organizing various time periods in the development of agricultural societies from the Neolithic to Chalcolithic to Bronze Age to Iron Age. And pottery has become an important source of information for understanding not only the technological developments but also the development of craft specialization associated with ceramic technology. In this module, we are focusing our attention on understanding the technological component of ceramic studies. Techniques that were uh, developed during the Neolithic period, techniques that were developed during the Chalcolithic period and more and more advanced techniques that were developed during Bronze Age and Iron Age time periods. We have systematically um, collected uh, pottery from all these cultural periods and we have tried to also make experiments of how potteries were manufactured in the past as well as we have also carried out ethnographic studies of modern day potters in understanding how you know modern pottery technology and how moderns, mo modern pottery uh, potters uh, go about various stages of procuring raw material modifying the raw material or preparing the raw material and arriving at some basic forms of pots and then finishing the pots. These four or five aspects of pottery making are relevant to understanding how in the ancient period, particularly in the Neolithic or later in the Chalcolithic, pottery were you know, manufactured and based on ethnographic um, you know, analogies, we also are in a position to reconstruct the processing sequence associated with pottery manufacture in the Neolithic past or Chalcolithic past or later periods. Normally in archaeological literature you come across um, pottery, pot shirts, pottery technology and so on. But here this particular module is called ceramic you know, technology module. The word ceramic comes from the word keramos meaning burnt clay or burned clay or earthenware. Earthenware is an again pottery made from soil, you know, a particular type of clay that was selected for making pottery. And that is why ceramic is the term that is generally applied in scientific literature. And once clay is given a shape and then subject to heat, it becomes the most durable uh, object made by man. And once pottery gets broken and gets buried in the soil, archaeological uh, sites, it will never be further broken. So pot sheds remain intact for hundreds of thousands of years. And they constitute an important source of information when archaeologists are able to collect systematically the pot sheds, reconstruct the original shapes, and then understand the functional aspects, understand the techniques of making pottery understand the context in which this pottery was manufactured. Now, right in the beginning, pottery was not subject to firing. Early stages of pottery making was um, only uh, very, very simple when, pot when clay was modified into different forms and they were dried in the sun. But this kind of pottery which was sun dried or made of, uh, you know, uh, soft earth, uh, earthy material did not last long, it had no durability at all. So over a period of time, uh, our ancestors learned the fact that when the same clay uh, which is modified, which is molded or which is given a form is subject to heat, it will become more and more durable or harder and uh, it becomes resistant to weathering. That is why pottery was made, um, was finished by heating in a furnace, open furnace or a closed furnace or anything. There are a couple of uh, instances of uh, 
sun dried pottery or unfired pottery coming from archaeological context but they are very in they come from very early stages of pottery manufacturing that we have documented through archaeological investigations and once uh, pottery is subject to heating it becomes hard and it also develops uh, um, you know um, durability and it is subject to uh, repeated use by the makers the earliest clay objects were fa were figurines of mother goddess or venus figurines from the from took the odobert cave in france and dolny westernis in czechoslovakia in europe these belong to the upper paleolithic period dated to circa 30000 bc clay was used to plaster walls floor and also as daub in the wattle and daub structures in various regions adobe bricks that is clay bricks dried in the sun were used in the construction of floor and roof in the jagros region between 7500 and 6300 bc so what we are trying to hear uh, impress upon is that the oldest burnt clay objects have been found in the upper paleolithic context but not in the neolithic context what we find in the neolithic context is an invention that was essential for storing water food and also for processing food whereas in the context of upper paleolithic we get objects which are of you know belief which represent some belief system amongst our ancestors so these venus figurines are also known as mother goddesses now this mother goddess phenesis uh, date back to 30 to 35000 years uh, ago now clay also was subject to variety of use particularly um, in as a daub uh, when these uh, early huts were constructed by our ancestors so early huts were constructed during the neolithic period and these were uh, also called wattle and daub structures now these wattle and daub structures were made of bamboo reed and such other you know plant material so in order to fill the gaps in order to make sure that there is no percolation of water and such things this clay was also used to pack this that is in other words they call it daubing the interior and exterior surface of the wattle and these this kind of uh, wattle and daub structures go back to the early neolithic period Uh, the sites that are well known sites are in the region of jagros mountains in northern iran and uh, further westwards into iraq and so on and so forth in addition to uh, using clay for different purposes they also used bamboo natural gold and such other plant materials for for use as containers so we have the earliest uh, examples of these uh, natural uh, plant materials which were also used for Uh, you know storing or carrying um, you know water and other kinds of things liquid things and uh, used and they were also used as molds um, you know for making uh, making uh, forms out of clay the earliest pottery comes from the sites beldibi and satal hayuk in southern turkey and these have been dated to 8500 bc Pottery begins to occur at sites in Syria between 6000 and 4500 BC. Although the Jomon ware from Japan is dated to circa 12000 BC, more reliable TL dating has placed this ware in mid 6th millennium BC. Now, there is always uh, uh, some amount of controversy in fixing the age of the earliest pottery that has been found in archaeological context. so there have been claims uh, from east asian archaeologists especially those in japan and china that they have the oldest pottery anywhere in the world that was made by you know our ancient ancient agricultural communities and there are also a couple of sites in turkey satal hayuk particularly is an important site in turkey and also the syrian sites in the you know what we call uh, the fertile crescent area where we tra we we have very successfully traced the origins of agricultural way of life um and the earliest neolithic sites are situated in that region there also uh, pottery evidence does not go beyond 10000 bc so in this context we have to be careful when we get uh, get to know about very very early pottery in eastern asia and then we have a site in the 
uh, Indian subcontinent, particularly in the Indo-Iranian borderlands, the Bolan Valley, which is a well-known uh, pass between uh, uh, Southwest Asia and uh, Indian subcontinent. We have a site called Mehergar, which were discovered uh, in 1974 by the French archaeological mission to Pakistan. And there, uh, we have the oldest Neolithic site anywhere in the subcontinent. And that site has given evidence of uh, the oldest pottery, which was handmade, and also evidence of oldest bricks, handmade uh, bricks in, from that particular site. And because of the discoveries made at Mehergar, we, have now, we are now in a position to very definitively say that even the Indus civilization gradually developed from the Neolithic phase, Chalcolithic phase and to the Bronze Age. Pottery did not originate in one place or region and diffused to other regions. Indeed, pottery making began and gradually evolved with the necessities that arose with the changing economy. The transition from hunting, scavenging economy to the food gatherer and later food producing economy necessitated pottery production. The emergence of pottery can be ascribed to the beginnings of agriculture and settled communities. So there are theories about origins of pottery, like the dates that are uh, there which confuse whether you know pottery originated in East Asia or in Southwest Asia. And then there are also theories which, uh, uh, which suggest that pottery was invented in one place and later it was, uh, you know, it dispersed into um, <coughs> other places, other areas. This is called diffusionary um, explanation of origin and expansion of pottery technology uh, in the ancient world. But certainly pottery played a very, very important role um, in the emergence of agricultural societies. And then pottery invention became essential because the economy of uh, hunting gathering societies and uh, early agricultural societies necessitated production of earthenware pottery for various purposes. Uh, the main purpose being storage and processing. And that is why we also have a very clear um, idea now that archaeological sites of that particular time period, say Neolithic period, have now been found widely distributed across uh, um, the region between Southwest Asia and Japan. And at, in, this, in, this, between, in this particular geographical stretch, we have distinctive geographical areas where we have very early Neolithic sites. And then we also have clear evidence from these sites that pottery also was developed independently in these regions. So agricultural way of life also developed independently in independent geographical environments. The appearance of pottery in the archaeological record has largely been associated with the Neolithic techno complex. Pottery has a great potential as archaeological evidence. This is, these two are very, very important points to remember because Although there are suggestions that pottery was uh, invented earlier than the Neolithic, but there are several sites um, in different parts of the world where even in the Neolithic period, pottery did not appear right from the beginning. And in the Neolithic, we also have two stages of development, which is identified as pre-pottery Neolithic and proper pottery Neolithic. And so it is now very, very clear that definite evidence of pottery technology and the first appearance of uh, well-made pottery appears in the Neolithic. And this uh, gave rise to a very significant body of evidence for archaeologists because archaeologists have based the reconstructions of the development of agricultural societies uh, by organizing distinctive varieties of pottery uh, from different strata. And this has also enabled archaeologists to trace the origin and development of agricultural way of life in distinctive geographical areas. This was very, very helpful in the absence of uh, uh, absolute dating methods for dating pottery. Pottery can be dated using the thermoluminescence method and so can provide absolute dates for a culture or layers ascribed to a particular culture. The seriation method can be used in which 
types and weights of pottery can be compared with other well dated archaeological contexts or sites and thus relative dating can be understood. To begin with, in a agricultural settlement where culture history had a uh, prolonged existence, the development of uh, the culture history of that particular site was based on organizing pottery from different levels and different layers and identifying the first appearance of a particular type of pottery and the last appearance of a particular type of pottery. Now first appearance and last appearance of that pottery characterizes a time period. And following this you have a new pottery appearing and this new pottery continues for some time and then it also gets terminated. Now this second type of pottery also helps in identifying a developed stage of uh, that particular cultural uh, you know, community. So this was going to help in organizing uh, relative chronology of culture history of a particular settlement. But with the coming of techniques like thermoluminescence dating, which is applicable to pottery which was subjected to heat treatment uh, up to about 400 degrees and more. Only such pottery which was subjected to heat treatment is suitable for dating thermoluminescence by dating thermoluminescence dating method. So in the context of uh, um, later period pottery which was subject to heating have now been found suitable for TL dating and as a result we have absolute dates for the pottery. So if we have a site where we have sequence of pottery um, which could be dated by thermoluminescence dating method, we are now able to use that particular uh, sequence of pottery as well as the sequence of dates as a type sequence and compare that with the sites where we do not have you know, uh, absolute dates for the pottery. Now this kind of comparison of pottery from dated site to an undated site is called seriation. Regional distribution of different cultures can be identified by the presence and distribution of certain characteristic type and wear of pottery. The source of the clay used to make pottery can be identified by adopting petrological methods. Now regional distribution means for example in the context of uh, Harappan civilization the spatial extent of Harappan civilization or geographical extent of Harappan civilization can be determined on the basis of distribution of that particular Harappan pottery, black on redware. Now this black on redware pottery distribution over a geographical area helps us demarcate that area as area belonging to that particular black and redware. So if this particular black and redware belongs to Harappan period, this area covered by black and redware represents the area covered by Harappan culture. So similarly, the pottery which was made from a particular clay also needs to be identified. We should know where from they procured the, the raw material. Without knowing uh, where from they procured raw material, we will not be able to understand the processes involved in manufacturing pottery. So that is why there are geological techniques which is called petrology. Petrology means understanding the mineral composition of rock. Now clay is also a rock. It is very found powdery material. So it also contains minerals which are of very very small size, minute size. They are microscopic in nature. So the clays are formed over weathered bedrock. Now we collect clay samples from different areas wherever there is a clay occurring and then also identify the mineralogy of the clay which was used for making pottery. So if we are able to match the mineralogical composition of pottery with the clay that has been collected from different places that helps in identifying the source for making pottery. This is called provenance study. Now this is not only peculiar to understanding pottery, it also applies to understanding any other material which were produced by the, uh, you know, either the Neolithic people or even Stone Age people where they procured the suitable raw material stone, particular stone for making their hand axe or cleaver or, you know, even a simple blade tool and so on.
When the source of clay which was employed in pottery making and also the period and culture to which the pottery belongs has been identified, much is known about the authors of the tradition. So what it means is that uh, we identify a particular people with the type of pottery. So we have, as I said, black and red ware people, we have grey ware people, we have painted grey ware people and these people and the word culture are interchangeable in archaeological context. So we say painted ware culture and black and red ware culture so on. The surfaces of pottery and so also the potsherds in archaeological assemblages bear marks which are evidences of the farming, finishing and firing techniques employed in its manufacture. A study based on this would understand the technology of pottery making. So the surface features on pottery are also very critical for archaeologists to reconstruct various uh, you know, aspects of pottery making and also uh, understand if uh, these people made different types of pottery for different functions. So there are pottery, pottery shapes and pottery types and uh, also tell us something more than technology but in terms of understanding for what particular purpose a particular type of pottery was made is now you know possible because we have lot of ethnographic parallels. Pottery basically are tools and containers for food preparation and storage. The study of morphology and function of the many types of pottery provide information on the dietary and culinary aspects of communities. Apart from these questions, pottery also provides evidences for exchange pattern and trade between regions and communities. This is a very, very important uh, you know, um, understanding of the significance of pottery in archaeological context. Because if civilizations have developed in different parts of the world, they were primarily based on surplus production of any particular you know, product and sub share that particular product among the people within the a particular defined geographical area and then beyond through trade and exchange. Trade played a very important role in the rise of civilizations. Pottery throws light on aspects of social hierarchy, spatial distribution, both inter-site and intra-site and social complexities. Now, the Pottery production process involves you know, series of stages. First and foremost is procurement of raw material as we talk about provenance. So we have to identify a place where clay of suitable grade is available for procurement. And this is followed by preparation of that particular raw material for making pottery. So the clay that you occur from, uh, procure from a, a particular uh, formation is not ready for you know, modifying that into a pottery. So there are impurities, there are coarse grained rock pieces and other kinds of unwanted things uh, which will come in the way of uh, you know, developing a smooth paste, uniform, uniform paste. So that is why that removing uh, uh, extraneous material which is not wanted in the pottery uh, making uh, process has to be eliminated. Now this is followed by what is called forming process. Forming is giving a shape that you have in your mind. Uh, the giving a shape that you would like the pottery to be um, you know of a particular size and uh, you know volume and so on and so forth. And then finishing it. Finishing is even more important once the pottery takes a particular form it needs to be finished in terms of its features, interior as well as exterior features. All of them need to have uniform surface features, uh, both inside and outside. Uh, roughness of the surface features outside as well as inside needs to be smoothened out and so on. So finishing and finishing also involves um, uh, making pottery look attractive as well in terms of uh, applying a slip, in terms of uh, applying a color and in terms of uh, applying designs on the exterior surface of the pottery. And then the most important step uh, in the process of making pottery is firing. Now as we have been discussing right in the beginning pottery was sun dried. But over a period of ma time man learned that if the pottery has to be durable 
it needs to be subject to firing. So firing helps in uh, hardening the pottery. It also helps in reducing the porosity of the pottery and so on and so forth. So after firing, even some of the decorations on the outer side of the pottery uh, were also executed with the help of uh, pigments, black pigment, red pigment, white pigment and so on and so forth. Workable clay is generally obtained from a distance of 1 to 6 kilometers from the manufacturing site. This statement we make based on the fact that we studied a potter in the village of Sanganakallu, which is a major Neolithic site that we know uh, in southern India. And this site is uh, located uh, about 7 kilometers north uh, east of Bellari. And it's a major uh, Neolithic site where uh, we have um, a continuous uh, settlement history uh, going for a period of nearly 1500 years. Now this village has uh, a potter community which still manufactures pottery in this traditional, uh, using traditional methods. So the previous slide explained various stages of procuring raw material and finishing and on so on. So we wanted to look at these potters in Sangankalu village and uh, uh, find out what were the you know, steps taken by these potters to procure raw material and give a form and then uh, finish it uh, after firing and then also decorate the surface of pottery and so on. So what we have learned from this uh, uh, interaction with the local potters is that so if the, the potters generally procure the clay not from the immediate neighborhood but from a distance. It is not always not possible that you have the ideal clay available right at the site where you have set up your pottery um, manufacturing center. So that is why we say that at, at Sanganakallu the suitable clay does not occur right in the village or in the immediate vicinity of the village but it occurs some uh, 1.5 kilometers from the village. Tempering materials. So generally clay is uh, uh, not directly used because if it adding tempering material always gives greater cohesiveness to the clay. That is why tempering material, there are varieties of tempering material. You have husk, you have ash, uh, you have uh, other kinds of organic material uh, which are uh, useful for uh, as, as tempering materials and that gives greater strength to the clay and that clay becomes more and uh, more, and more uh, malleable for making uh, or giving form and then making it harder and so on and so forth. And tempering material also helps in uh, you know, strengthening the, um, uh, the pottery uh, from breakage and so on. In the, when we studied the Sanganakalu uh, pottery technology, sand from uh, nearby areas uh, were also uh, collected for um, adding uh, to the clay as tempering material. Another requirement for firing is fuel and fuel you know you have to have you know you have various various types of fuel in the simplest uh, uh, situation you have uh, various types of dried twigs and wood and uh, other kinds of material and uh, Bellari in you know the semi-arid area we have this uh, uh, acacia uh, uh, wild growth of acacia and this acacia is abundant in this area and this acacia uh, branches were cut, dried and then used for uh, firing pottery. Preparation of raw material. Impurities like lithic and organic material are removed from the clay by hand picking and sieving. Tempering materials are also sieved and mixed into the clay along with water and kneaded by feet. So the clay needs to be purified in order to get a uniform grade material. So if it has impurities like stone pieces and then other unwanted material uh, as you know in the clay it has to be removed and this is done by you know hand picking and then tempering materials which are which are to be added to the clay will also be you know cleaned in the, the, the sense that if there are impurities which are coarser material will be removed and then it will be mixed with uh, soil. So forming techniques there are um, hand building, uh, wheel thrown and then combination of uh, uh, techniques. These are, these, are, these, these are different ways of uh, you know, developing uh, uh, a form to the pottery. So hand techniques uh, involve um, pinching, uh, slab building, molding and coiling method. And then paddle and anvil technique. In, in case of wheel thrown pottery technique, uh, wheel is the um, 
wheel is used for turning pottery and then composite technologies uh, involve a uh, combination of both uh, you know coiling techniques and turntable technique and uh, uh, coiling and uh, uh, what we call pinching technique coiling and paddle and uh, anvil technique and wheel turn and paddle and anvil technique this combination is uh, generally uh, 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 made to make sure that the pottery form takes a very uh, uniform um, outer and in, uh, outer uh, you know uh, shape so forming technique which involves pinching pinching is one of the simplest of all hand building techniques a lump of clay is held in hand and in the center of the lump a depression is made as shown in the slide then the walls are drawn using the thumb and forefinger as you can see in this slide the rim is also formed by pinching the clay with the fingers sometimes this method is employed in forming the lower part of the body this results in an uneven body so that is a disadvantage stones old broken parts baskets and even the gold are used as molds so the earliest forms which were uh, you know arrived at were based on some of this natural uh, you know mat plant material so gold also gave um, uh, you know an idea of the form for pottery and baskets were also of uh, use to get a form for pottery clay is plastered either on the exterior or the interior of the molds this is further dried and then removed using a separator this technique is used to make entire pots and also only the lower body of the pot slab building method this is simplest of all the methods slabs of clay are rolled on a flat surface or flattened using hands these clay slabs are joined by pressing or smearing this technique is well suited to build large pots and more specifically non round shaped vessels then we have the coiling technique this is uh, relatively uh, more popular uh, in the context of pottery we have found uh, in the archaeological context the coiling technique is most common among handmade techniques coiling is a primary forming technique where rolls or coils of clay of uniform thickness are produced by rolling as we can see on the slides and uh, rolling the clay horizontally on a flat surface or vertically between hands these coils are then placed along the circumference and gradually increasing in height coiling involves a spiral building of the walls of the pot as you can see here a variant of this is the ring building method where coils of clay are arranged along the circumference to form a ring this can hardly be identified in all archaeological assemblages because when the pot is finished the surface becomes uniform and there are no features uh, indicating whether it was made by coiling uh, method or not the coils are pressed with the fingers and then made to adhere to each other in both coiling as well as ring building techniques there is no uniformity in the wall thickness this is the disadvantage horizontal corrugations can be noticed on pottery produced by employing this method the diameter of the clay coils largely depends on the size of the pot so thicker the coil size uh, means you are planning to produce a larger pot thinner the coil size you are uh, you are intending to produce a smaller pot coiling method can be used to produce small medium and also large sized pottery although coiling can be employed to form the whole vessel from the base to the rim it is usually accompanied by other forming techniques techniques too the lower part of the vessel may be formed using any of the other techniques like molding or pinching the paddle and anvil method is actually a pre final uh, finishing uh, kind of a method here this is in fact a secondary forming or finishing technique pottery that has been formed initially by employing any of the various techniques which we discussed till now undergoes secondary forming in this method the potter uses a wooden mallet shaped tool or paddle and a spherical stone anvil to shape the pot as shown in the in this slide the anvil is used as a support 
and the paddle is used to beat the walls and base of the pot. This results in achieving uniformity in the thickness of the walls and also increases the volume of the pot. A lump of clay is placed on the wheel head and the wheel or turntable is rotated. A steady momentum of the wheel is maintained throughout the process. So this description relates to the use of wheel for making pottery. So the potter opens a hole at the center of the lump on the wheel by pressing his thumb down to the lump as the wheel rotates. Pressure is applied by his thumb and finger and the clay is lifted upwards as shown in the slide. Once the desired height is achieved, the potter gives shape by applying additional pressure. He then goes on to shape the rim and smoothen the surface of the pot while still in motion. The pot thus formed is then separated from the wheel and sometimes subjected to secondary forming such as paddle and anvil method. Now finishing techniques. Finishing techniques uh, are of two different kinds. One is utilitarian aspect and another is aesthetic aspect. Utilitarian aspect refers to a particular shape of the pottery and uh, the feature on the outer surface of the pottery and decoration refers to aesthetics refers to um, this how the exterior surface external surface is subject to um, you know decoration with the help of pigments now finishing involves scraping trimming and shaving shaping refers to removal of excess clay from both the exterior and interior of the pottery using a hard tool like sharp edged stone pottery Trimming involves cutting excess of clay from the exteriors using a hard tool and shaving refers to removal of excess clay from the exterior leaving angular facets on the surface. This is in the context of utilitarian uh, aspect of finishing. Now utilitarian aspect of finishing also involves the use of paddle and anvil technique. This is because when the, this technique is employed, the shape of the pottery may also be altered along with making the walls more compact and dense. Smoothing. Smoothing the outer surface and inner surface is very, very important. Non-lustrous means it does not give any shine. Done with the help of a soft tool like cloth, fingers, etc. Rustication is coarse surface as an effect of rubbing with a fibrous irregular tool. Burnishing. Burnishing is also an important uh, you know, technique for finishing the pottery. Burnished pottery is very, very common in the archaeological context. So lustrous surface produced with the rubbing of a hard tool like a pebble, stone pebble. Polishing results in very uniform luster because of rubbing with a hard tool and above all the above mentioned techniques do not aim at altering the shape of the pottery that's very very important and they produce distinct surface features and also have distinct utilities slipping is another important uh, finishing uh, te technique in this case the uniform application of a thin layer of clay sometimes similar as the body and sometimes distinctly different the same original color of the body um, is retained by applying a slip of similar color or sometimes a different colored slip is also given. Glazing. Glazing is a later development. A glaze is formed on the surface due to the addition of a flux during firing. And this produces a lustrous surface. Both these methods reduce the porosity of the pottery. That is the important um, aspect of this particular glazing. Now let us look at uh, the aesthetic aspect of finishing pottery. Now painting is one such thing, applique is another way and impressed uh, designs are another kind. These three are generally observed on the outer surface of the pot. So painting also refers to monochrome and polychrome. Monochrome means one color, polychrome means more than one color. So like monochrome is gray ware, buff ware, you know, pale gray ware, things like that. Polychrome or bichrome is black and red ware, 
uh, and uh, black on uh, redware, white painted black and redware, things like that. Now, incised designs are also common on the outer surface of the pottery. So, incision is made using a sharp stylus like instrument, a pointed tool. Applic, application of clay designs and motifs. So, external application is also done. Impressed, impressions of fingers, seals, rope on the body or applied bands. So, impressed, uh, you know, uh, designs are also seen on the pot. These types of decorations are noticed in varying degrees during the Neolithic period and even later. Now, firing technique also has uh, two important uh, uh, methods. One is open air firing, another is kiln based firing. Open air firing refers to a shallow pit of about 5 feet diameter in which uh, on the floor of the pit uh, you spread the fuel and then you put the pottery which is subject which is to be set on fire. So, the firing pit is used even today and that we have also documented from the site of Sanganakallu. Pottery is stacked vertically in a pit and is covered with broken pot sheds and ash from free previous firing and the fuel is laid on top of the stack. The firing process is completed within 6 to 8 hours. This involves the construction of a permanent structure. There are two types of kilns, updraught and downdraught kiln based on the position of fuel and the movement of heat. This method of firing can be seen in modern ceramic industries and studios. The use of kiln is in ancient potting traditions in the Indian subcontinent is so far not known, but we have documented uh, you know, kilns from the Chalcolithic context in Northern Deccan. Now, analysis of archaeological syllabics is very, very important for reconstructing various aspects of uh, you know, prehistoric societies. And this involves the study of surface of pot sheds for marks that have resulted from forming process. Classification of pot sheds in terms of weights and surface marks. So, surface marks include designs and so on, painted color, color of the painting, uh, and the pigment used for you know uh, decorating the surface of the pot as well as uh, you know you varieties of pot sheds you know belonging to different colors different weights and so on this provides information on the technology employed in pottery production so analysis of pottery uh, is also done in the laboratory and pottery pieces or pot sheds can be examined microscopically to identify the inclusions. Inclusions. The, if the clay is uh, monotonous, you can identify. If the clay is mixed with uh, other kinds of materials, tempering materials, that can also be identified through a microscopic study. Advanced methods of thin section analysis, X-ray diffraction, scanning electron microscopy, etc give better understanding of the fabric of the pottery, clay paste board. Fabric refers to the texture, the grain size and the technical aspects of making clay and so on and so forth. So these uh, modern techniques are useful for understanding the fabric of the pottery that comes from an archaeological context. And fabric analysis helps us make very fine resolution in terms of distinctive varieties of pottery and also it helps in also identifying the, the final stages of manufacturing the pottery. So understanding the technology, choice of inclusions, firing conditions and at what temperatures these uh, pots were heated can also be understood. Morphology refers to shape, involves classification of pottery based on broad shapes, restricted and unrestricted, rim types, rounded, beveled, etc. and shape of the vessel, global or carinated and so on and so forth. 
This type of classification helps in understanding the dietary and culinary practices of the period. Now, different types of pottery were made to serve a particular purpose. So, that can be reconstructed with the help of ethnographic studies and also making experiments. Now, vessels are shaped to fulfill certain specific cooking and storing needs. The reconstruction of the shape can lead to understanding the cooking methods and storing needs of the people. So, we, we have some perforated pot that has given us an idea perhaps the steam cooking was also practiced by our ancient people. Okay. Analysis of archaeological ceramics. So, morphological includes restricted and unrestricted form. So, we have given an example of unrestricted form. You have a wide bowl like shape. Restricted means it will have a narrow lake and so on and so forth. Ethnoarchaeological, as I said, we study modern day potters in order to make an authentic reconstruction of, you know, the processes involved in manufacturing pottery. Involves the study of present day potter communities and the pottery technology employed by the present day potters. Comparing the modern pottery assemblages morphological and technological aspects of archaeological ceramics. So, there is a comparative study of modern uh, pottery, pottery technology and so on and so forth along with the study of uh, pottery from archaeological context. Such comparative studies provide insights into plausible functions of pottery forms, technology involved in pottery manufacture in archaeology and continuous or change in pottery traditions through time. I hope uh, the explanation given to you so far uh, has given you a fairly uh, good idea of uh, pottery technology, the importance of uh, understanding uh, the technology of making pottery and in, you know, the importance of pottery in the archaeological reconstructions and so on. Now, in, along with this particular uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation, if you read the e-text, uh, your understanding of uh, the significance of uh, uh, ceramic studies in archaeology will be much better. Thank you.